Right now on the Daily Debrief, police released the 911 call, which resulted in the investigation into actor Jesse Smollett. They, they, they put a noose around his neck. Also, singer R. Kelly appears before a judge to face 11 new charges. And the Florida cop accused of failing to protect students during a deadly shooting is out on bond. Plus, the state rests its case in an alleged love triangle murder for hire plot. The Daily Debrief recaps the day in court. It's Thursday, June 6. Welcome to the Debrief, everybody. Professor Gwen Stern is along with me tonight. Let's get straight to the news because Chicago police have released two 911 calls involving the alleged racist attack on actor Jesse Smollett. Prosecutors recall dropped the charges against Smollett for allegedly concocting the attack with two others with whom he worked. The calls were placed by someone who says he worked with Smollett and who said he was going to make Smollett report the matter because it was said to involve a noose around Smollett's neck. The caller admitted Smollett was uneasy about reporting the supposed incident. I just see the police to come by. Um, I work with an artist. I, I, I don't really want to say his name, but he stayed here. He, was, he went to Subway. He was walking by and some guys. I don't know if he jumped him or something like that, and I just want to report it and make sure he's all right. Okay, so we just checking the well-being. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so you going back to the apartment? So you just going to leave him there? Yeah, I, I, I came down because I didn't realize the, the address. I, I didn't realize the address, and you know he was cool. He didn't want me to call you guys, but I feel like he needs to make a report. <laughs> Okay, so did okay. You can't make the report for him. Did he want to make a report? No, no he, 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 he I, that's why I'm, I'm doing. You, he's definitely going to make the report. I'm going to make him make the report. Does your friend need an ambulance? I, I, he just, he just, he, I just think he's startled. Well, it's really weird, ma'am, just because I'm scared. I don't know what it is. They, they, they put a noose around his neck. Okay, that caller did not directly identify Smollett. Just referred to him as an artist. Many parts of the call, including the caller's name, phone number, and the address where police were, were dispatched, were actually beeped out by authorities, as you heard, due to privacy concerns. R&B singer R. Kelly returned to a Chicago courtroom today to answer 11 new charges involving alleged sex crimes. The new charges include accusations of aggravated criminal sexual abuse, aggravated criminal sexual assault, and criminal sexual assault. The charges stem from the account of one accuser who was among the four whose accounts resulted in 10 separate original counts against R. Kelly back in February. Prosecutors say three of the accusers in this case overall were underage girls and that the conduct in question occurred between 1998 and 2010. Here is today's official plea. The state went back to the grand jury on this case only and the grand jury returned a new indictment against you. All right. The new indictment alleges additional counts against you, and that's why you're here today. I need to arraign you on that new indictment, on that case only. You understand that? I'm going to tender a copy of this new indictment to counsel. Thank you, Judge. I'll acknowledge receipt. Uh, I did get a copy ahead of time. I reviewed it with Mr. Kelly. Will I please and not guilty? All right. He has a composite bond in all four of these cases of a million dollars. He has actually... For $250,000. Right. For a total composite of a million dollars. And I think that's a sufficient bond. Uh, he's been in compliance with the court's uh, orders regarding pretrial services and also appearing in court as required. So that bond will stand. Mr. Kelly, you, on this new indictment, I need to advise you, as I told you before, you're out on bond. It's incumbent upon you to appear in court on each and every court date. If you willingly fail to appear in court while you're out on bond, this matter could proceed to a jury trial outside your presence. If that jury were to find you guilty and you're not here, I could sentence you while you're not here. Do you understand what I just advised you? At the end of that hearing, the state dropped one of its original cases against R. Kelly and decided to replace it with this new case. Kelly today stands accused of 18 counts in total. Meanwhile, a Georgia grand jury has indicted R. Kelly's former manager. TMZ reports that this man, James Mason, is accused of threatening to kill the father of one of R. Kelly's girlfriends. Mason is charged with making terroristic threats. 
The charge is a felony and could result in a one to 10 year prison sentence. The school resource officer charged for failing to act during last year's deadly shooting in Parkland, Florida, was in court today. Scott Peterson accused, is accused of child neglect, culpable negligence, and perjury. A judge originally set his bond at $102,000 for all of the counts he faces, but his attorneys today successfully moved to reduce that down to $39,500. Peterson posted the lower bond and is free pending trial. The judge also changed her mind and said Peterson will not have to wear an ankle monitor. In court documents, the defense noted that training documents say Peterson was not required to barge into the school during the shooting because he was working alone. And now to Texas, where the state has rested its case against the second person tried in the alleged love triangle murder for hire plot which left a young dentist dead. Brenda Delgado is accused of plotting for months to kill Kendra Hatcher. Hatcher was dating Delgado's ex-boyfriend, Ricardo Paniagua. She's accused of paying trigger man Christopher Love in money and drugs to actually shoot and kill Hatcher. Getaway driver Crystal Cortez pleaded guilty and agreed to testify against Love and Delgado. Love was already convicted and is on death row. This case is turning into a fight about cell phone records, but first, the state's case wrapped up with this, a description of the injuries Kendra Hatcher suffered. And what injuries did you find on this body? Um, there were uh, gunshot wounds. And where were the gunshot wounds located? So there was an entrance that was located on the occipital scalp or the back of the head, and then there was an exit gunshot wound that's noted on the submental region of the head, meaning underneath the chin. Are you looking for any type of, or are you able to tell the trajectory of that bullet wound? Yes. And what was the trajectory? It's going to be a back to front, downward, and slightly left to right. <laughs> Did you find signs of other injuries outside of that bullet wound? Uh, yes, there were some superficial um, abrasions or scrapes um, that were on the uh, right side of the forehead and the cheek as well as the chest and um, on the hands as well and the right elbow too. During the state's case, a law enforcement analyst talked about the number of phone calls between the defendant, the trigger man, and the getaway driver. Well, this is a link analysis chart and it's showing inbound and outbound phone calls and text messages between parties. So this is uh, the cell traffic, which is text messages or calls between Brenda Delgado, Crystal Cortez, and Crystal Cortez, and Christopher Love. You will see the arrows. The arrows indicate which direction the phone is calling or texting to. So you'll see Crystal Cortez is making 95 transactions between her phone and Brenda Delgado. And then you'll see 131 transactions coming between <coughs> Brenda Delgado uh, to Crystal Cortez. On the bottom, you'll see there's 46 transactions between Crystal to Christopher Love, and then 111 going between Christopher Love and Crystal Cortez. Some of those phone records might suggest that the defendant was not communicating directly with the trigger man, but other witnesses made the link by saying all three of the alleged conspirators were in contact. Which three of the individuals did you see having discussions during the time that you were staying in that trap house? Crystal, Brenda, and Chris. Now, do you recall how many times you saw them having discussions? Maybe two or three times at the kitchen table. And when they would come over um, have the discussions, did they speak English? Brenda did not. Crystal spoke English for Brenda. Chris did speak English. Would Crystal translate for Brenda? Yes, sir. Were you made aware of the subject of those conversations? No, sir, not right off the bat. Kelly's an idiot. <laughs> you wouldn't tell Kelly anything that she would want to get out in general. So anything that might or could possibly lead to somebody getting in trouble or causing problems? Kelly's going to be a snitch. You would not want Kelly to know? Nope. And you know this from having known him and having lived him. For a little bit over five years. And what about the defendant's alleged obsession with her ex-boyfriend and his new girlfriend? The cell phone analyst you heard from a minute ago said Brenda Delgado kept a cache of pictures on her phone to fuel that obsession. Who was that in image of? That's a picture of Ricky, her ex-boyfriend. Uh, and that's Dr. Ricardo Peniagua, is that correct? Correct. Okay. 
And when is this uh, photo created? May 24, 2015. And then looking at State's Exhibit 188, when was this photo created in defendant's cell phone? June 15, 2015. And who is in that photo? That is her ex-boyfriend, Ricky, and Dr. Uh, Kendra Hatcher. And State's Exhibit 185, what does that look like? Looks like a Find My iPhone uh, snapshot. And State's Exhibit 186, does that appear to be the same snapshot? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And when was that photo created? May 25th, 2015. And it says Find My iPhone, but who iPhone does it appear to belong to? Ricky. So on May 25th of 2015, there's a photo of Ricky's iPhone location inside of the defendant River Dove Island cell phone. That's correct. With me tonight here on The Debrief is Gwen Stern, a law professor at the Klein School of Law. So what's the defendant doing with this cache of pictures on the phone? It's the ex, it's the new girlfriend, and it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good at all. I mean, she is clearly cyber stalking uh, her ex-boyfriend um, and the dentist. I mean, she, she is clearly doing that. You teach trial advocacy, okay, the art of putting on a trial like this. So how do you think the state's doing? The state rested today. How do you think the state's done? I think done? the state is doing a great job. I mean, the state put on uh, the defendant's cousin who said that she asked him to um, uh, kill the dentist, put on her friend. Um, they have no reason to lie. They have no reason to lie at all. I think the prosecution is doing a really good job. A couple of those witnesses looked like they really didn't want to be on the I, stand. They didn't want to be there, but they, they got up there and they said their piece. So, so I tend to believe them, you know, oh, I don't really want to talk about this, but this is what happened. Especially the gentleman Ortiz who, lend it, who lent the um, Jeep. He didn't want to be there either. Um, he was a friend. Um, all of these people are coming. The cousin, you could tell it, it pained him to testify against her. Exactly. And look, I always look at trial advocacy and say that there's an efficiency quotient that really helps the jury. And here, I think we see that because the state moved the witnesses very efficiently, very quickly. They didn't get into a lot of side matters. There wasn't a lot of irrelevant discussion about everything that ever happened to everybody in their entire life. It was efficient. It made the point and it moved along. And the state already rested. It was like a surgeon, in and out, and I thought they did a great job. That's what they should do, right? <laughs> exactly. We see too many other cases where exactly. they do that. The defense is trying to say, okay, you know, this isn't a triangle. This is the trigger man, and it's the getaway driver, and not the defendant who even had the relationship with the boyfriend. I know the defense has to come up with some theory, but look, I mean, I've rarely seen a case that's this strong for the state. I agree. I mean, the only thing that the defense did, which I thought was good, is to point out that Crystal Cortez had a motive to lie. I mean, she, she cut a deal. She got 35 years instead of a much, you know, higher sentence like Love got. So I think they did do, do a good job with that. Attack who you can with what exactly. you've got, and, and they don't have a lot, unfortunately, for the defense. Professor, we'll be back with you again at the end of the broadcast. And still ahead tonight here on The Debrief, verdict watches in two California cases. Plus, you watched as a South Carolina jury convicted a man of killing his five kids. The question now is his punishment. We're up to debate that after the break. Before we head back to court tonight, let's hear from Brian Ross on what he's working on tonight for his broadcast. Coming up tonight, Aaron, on Brian Ross Investigates. In the movies, art thieves are portrayed like the debonair Thomas Crown. But we're going to hear a different take tonight from the FBI agent who runs the Bureau's art theft squad, Tim Carpenter. Do you think it's still in the country? Well... Perhaps. Only perhaps. Perhaps. Carpenter's best known successes have involved the theft of the ruby red slippers used by Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz and the jersey stolen from quarterback Tom Brady right after the Super Bowl. But what about the theft almost 30 years ago at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston? The empty frames there, a reminder of what was taken and remains missing. That's tonight on Brian Ross Investigates, Aaron. Back to you.
We are waiting for possible verdicts in two California cases. A jury has been deliberating for five days over whether Chase Merritt in California murdered a business associate and his entire family. A documentary film crew attached to the defense in that case approached two alternate jurors for interviews recently. The judge banned the person who did the asking from covering the rest of the case because the jurors had not been officially dismissed. Another California jury is deciding the fate of Kellen Winslow II, a former NFL player accused of a series of sex crimes. Five women took the stand to accuse Winslow of the crimes listed on your screen, some in multiple counts. Winslow played 10 seasons with the Cleveland Browns and other teams. The accusers range in age from 17 to 77. We are back to the South Carolina trial of convicted murderer Timothy Jones. The jury must now turn to the penalty phase of this case. The question is whether Jones deserves life in prison or the death penalty for punishing his son to death and then systematically killing his other children as they found out. Kicking off this phase of the case, the prosecutor said the evil Jones was the real Jones. Never mind his claims of mental health issues. Throughout this trial, you've heard evidence that is so brutal, so callous, and so vicious, it can only be described as evil. A clear and unmistakable evil. He bears sole responsibility for the murders of his children. He alone is responsible for the murders of Mira, Elon, Natan, Gabriel, and Abigail. He bears responsibility for the suffering that's been inflicted for the rest of the lives of everyone who loved him so dearly. These wounds that he left, these wounds won't heal. So now you have your evidence as to why, in this case, the appropriate sentence is death. Thank you. The defense asked for a life sentence and focused jurors squarely on the defendant's mental health. You don't have to kill Tim Jones. We don't kill people who are sick. We respect your birth. You took time, you were thoughtful, you were careful in your deliberation, and we appreciate that. By your verdict, you have guaranteed that Tim Jones will never walk free again. But one day he will die in a prison cell, much like that. Each of you agreed during Floyd Deer that in order to determine whether or not the person lived or died, that you would need to determine the value of the life and that you would need to examine the whole life in order to determine its value. That's what this phase of the case is about. Each of you told us that you believe that life without the possibility of parole was an appropriate sentence for somebody who has been found guilty beyond reasonable doubt of murder of five children. You understood that any argument that says just because he's been found guilty of murder of five children, he therefore deserves the death penalty is an illegal argument. The state called one of the law enforcement officers who was with the defendant when the defendant led authorities to the place where he dumped the bodies of his children. About how far away was he from where the, the bags of these children were actually located? <clears throat> Excuse me, you had to walk, um, you know, a ways, but whenever he got out of the car, uh, he, it, 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 he didn't wander around. He just walked almost like directly you know, to a location um, that was in the uh, brushy, again, kind of clear-cut area. And probably, as, if I can try to illustrate something, uh, maybe about as far as where you're standing, Mr. Hubbard, to the back of the courtroom. What was your responsibility as far as those bags that contain what we now know are the bodies of the children and that whole scene. The state trooper that was there with us um, notified a coroner's office. And we ended up notifying two coroner's offices because we weren't even exactly <coughs> sure what county we were even in. Quite a few officials from the local sheriff's office, the Alabama State Police, 
came, and next thing I knew, there were two helicopters flying over us. They were dropping off um, uh, Alabama State um, law enforcement officials in suits um, that were there. So obviously the word had got out that, you know, um, five uh, dead bodies of children had been located in this remote area of Alabama. Returning for analysis to wrap up the broadcast here is Gwen Stern, law professor at the Klein School of Law. So, you know, we're at the stage of ultimate jeopardy here, ultimate jeopardy. This is where the client's life is on the line. How did the state do? How did the defense do in Make setting the stage for jurors this time? Insanity. I thought the state did a great job of pulling at the heartstrings of these jurors. I mean, it was gut wrenching to listen to these witnesses today showing the pictures, talking about the impact on them of the death of these children. In my opinion, there is no way that this defendant is not getting the death penalty. That's a pretty harsh statement uh, for you. It's a uh, harsh uh, prediction. That's my prediction. I, I could see that happening, certainly. You know, my fear in this is, okay, this defendant raised a bunch of mental health issues. And maybe the jury didn't believe beyond a reasonable doubt that those were real. Maybe the jury believed that they weren't enough to mitigate the accusations here. But when you start mixing mental health accusations against someone with a brain injury that's visible, that they can put up on the screen and say, he incurred this brain injury, he suffered this injury from a car crash, you can see it on a screen, he had other family members treated. When you start to mix that up with the death penalty, I smell years and years and years of appeals. There will be years and years of appeals, but this jury had the ability to find him guilty, but mentally ill. They had that as one of the possibilities. They did not do that. They went pure guilty on all five cases, and I think they've made their mind up. Okay, so even if the jury didn't find that, can we see this mental health issue injecting into the appeals? And could it be possible that the courts turn around and say, look, the law is you don't execute someone who uh, has mental health issues? I think this is a jury question. I mean, mitigating factors by the statute in South Carolina is definitely if there was a mental defect, but it's a jury question. I, I don't know that a court will overturn it. Now it's time for us to both brush up on our mental health intersection with the death penalty appeals cases. Professor, great to have you on the debrief. Thank I know you. we're going to be sticking be here. around as the coverage continues tonight because here on Law and Crime, we are waiting for verdicts, which could come at any time in those cases that we discussed earlier. I'll be sticking around for that until 8 o'clock Eastern. For those of you just watching the debrief, though, it's been great to see you. We'll see you back here tomorrow once again.